All right, I want to first put it out there for discussion about Daniel chapter 2 that we covered today. Um, in some ways, it, was, it can be like drinking from a fire hydrant as you work through the book of Daniel, same way as far as trying to preach it and figure out uh, what I should be, was that my coffee? Ooh, thank you. Um, what I should and should not include. Um, there's a lot of study. And as I was saying, the, many scholars will say, liberal scholars will say, there's no way that that book was written back when it was written because the accuracy with those kingdoms in particular, they'll just say, no, it had to be written much later because it has that information. And of course, that's where we stick our tongue out and say, you don't know the Bible and it's the word of God. And so God, who knows the beginning from the end, can do whatever he wants. And if he wants to reveal by name kingdoms that don't exist yet that are going to come and rule, he can do that. And that just shows who he is. So... Um, as I went through, I, I hope that um, you were able to follow along for those who were there this morning. Um, the, the dream, of course, as I said, you know, anytime we're interpreting Scripture, we want to really be careful that we don't rely on the historical context to give us the meaning. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, if you have to know the historical stuff outside of the Bible to understand what's inside of the Bible then that's going to be a problem for believers around the world today and throughout history. So let's say there's, a, this, there's, there's this big uh, discovery about something with the book of Daniel, something about Babylon, and that discovery happens today. And then we can go, oh, well, now with this discovery, we can finally understand the book of Daniel. Well, if that were true, then our brothers and sisters throughout history have not been able to understand the book of Daniel. And that would not be how our Lord has worked. He has given us his spirit and his word. The details that we need to know are in here. Now, the details outside of this are interesting, and we certainly see God working in history, and it's things that come along and show that the scriptures are the word of God. And things. But as far as trying to understand the meaning of the text, we should be able to be here right now and study Daniel chapter 2 and arrive at the same meaning as people who are in Africa in a village without any access to these other historical ideas, they should be able to get the same meaning in the text. Does that make sense? Do you have questions about that? If you have to have that historical stuff, I'm not saying it's not helpful or it makes it more interesting, but to arrive at meaning, then many of our brothers and sisters would not be able to arrive at meaning. So in that, when we go through, when I was going through this text, I really wanted to show you, yes, some of the things that were probably hap happening historically, but I didn't want us to get so focused in on that that we would miss the, the meaning in there. Does that make sense? So do you have any questions or thoughts about Daniel's dream, or Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and Daniel's interpretation of that in, those, in the kingdoms and things of, of that nature? Any questions about that? Yes, I will. Okay, so obviously he, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and the dream is this gigantic image, and it's a scary image. So anytime you look this up, if you go on Google or anything like that, it'll have like different you know, pictures, and some of them look kind of like a nice guy. Probably not that, because it was scary. It's going to be something that was frightening. But the head of the image was fine gold, and we know in this text, it tells us what the head is, who that is. That's, that's Babylon, right? Then right after that, its chest, arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So, and then he has this, the second part or the last part of the, the dream was this stone not cut by human hands that would come and crush it. So then it gets into the interpretation of that, and Daniel shows us that it is indeed, Babylon is the first one. Well, we know as you continue reading on in Daniel and you get into chapter 5, that the second one would be the Medo-Persians. So with that, it is interesting that it's silver, and it is interesting that it's the arms, so you could then say maybe both sides of Medo-Persian Empire together, possibly the, you know, the two there. Um, again, not as great in its glory as the Babylonian Empire, and again, going downstream is going to get worse and worse, but as far as the culture goes, but that would be the next one. Then in Daniel chapter 8, 
when it's talking about a different vision and dream, but it does talk about this next kingdom that's going to come, and that talks about Greece and names Greece in particular. And so, again, it does not till much later that Greece comes, and so that's why scholars are like, what? That can't happen. As far as, you know, that, this, this book must have been written later, but it's not. It's written before that. And so uh, Greece then would come and be the next one. And so the fourth one, we don't really know. It doesn't say, as far as biblically, we can't say for sure that, oh, it's definitely Rome. It certainly seems like it's Rome. And when you get into the next, the other vision, there's going to be some things about the symbolism there that we're going to talk about that seems to match up with that. Kind of like, what is the, what is the um, Cedar Key? What's our mascot here? Sharks, right? Think about that for a moment. It's a, a, an animal, a beast type thing, right? Well, there's going to be, that, that's not just unique to us doing that. That's been done throughout. And so some of the beasts and images that we're going to see are going to be similar to that. Can you imagine somebody a, a long time from now who maybe they didn't know what a shark was or didn't know, trying to explain, you know, oh, the Cedar Key sharks and using that, that imagery or language to try to explain about the school and what they do. And they devoured people and talking about our basketball team or something, right? And so uh, that's part of what we'll, we'll see when we move forward, you know, in those other visions. And so probably the, the fourth kingdom, again, I would say, I think is probably Rome. And so what I said to you this morning, some of that, some of you apparently had not heard that or thought of that before. Um, but because of what it says in verse... Um, 44, if you look down at verse 44, chapter 2, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. So in the days of those kings, well, what kings are we talking about there? And you can interpret that a couple different ways, but I'm going to say in the days of those kings, meaning all of those together. And so that's when I had my little example this morning of going back to, because I, I find it interesting that if you remember back in chapter 1, that Shinar was mentioned. Well, Shinar was the place of the Tower of Babel, and that's where this Babylon, the, the capital of Babylon ended up being there. But why mention Shinar like that? Well, I think textually, it's to get us to think back of the Tower of Babel. <laughs> Something's going on here. You're it's okay. He's like, you already talked about Daniel. Move on. So Shinar being the place of Babel, and that, again, is ultimately pride. That's what I was saying this morning, is pride. And so that being the heart of it, and these other kingdoms coming after the, you know, the Babylonians, Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And so what I was trying to get at this morning was that it's not just, yes, the, the, those kingdoms officially kind of come, came and went, but we're still influenced today by all of those kingdoms. And let me show you that in your notes, if you have your notes from today. I didn't get into it into the sermon. But some of the different things, and some of you can add more here than even I have, but with the Babylonians, the way that they have affected even um, life today, astrology, astronomy, medical stuff, mathematics, education, urbanization, and architecture. Think about how many people do the horoscopes. That is a huge influence on us even today. I would say sinful and wrong if that's something that you're trusting in. If you do it and you're looking at it and you laugh about it, okay. But if you really think that the way the stars aligned are going to affect who you're going to marry, that's a problem. It's not, it's not biblical, right? So that would be, be some of the things from the Babylonians. The Medo-Persians, again, also different forms of mathematics, agriculture, banking. Um, the first postal service, perhaps, was... Some would argue was uh, around that time. And uh, different architecture. Then you go with Greek. Think about philosophy, the way that we interact with ideas. Um, again, of course, architecture, astronomy, mathematics, art, sports with Greek. I mean, think of uh, Olympics and things of that nature. Still very much influencing us today, even the military. And then you get into the Roman Empire. And that's why my perspective would be that, yes, the empire itself doesn't look the same as it did. But how much does it still influence us today? And remember, in here, that one is supposed to, whatever that is, is supposed to continue on till this rock comes and destroys it. So either there's going to be like the Roman Empire comes back again, or some would say it's a neo, which means new. So neo-Roman Empire, and that's going to be some one world government or something of this nature. But ultimately, I'm not so certain that we're too far away from this, at least the influence of Rome even still today. So I brought up law, representative government. Um, 
That really became clear. Language, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, even English. Military strategy, of course, architecture, engineering. And then I, po- I pushed in on even the Catholic Church. Because that was really what you saw with Christianity being linked with the, the state there. And that still has an influence today. The Catholic Church... Now, doc, now, I'm not saying there are not some Catholics who are Christians. I do believe that there can be Catholics who are Christians. But if you look at the theology of what's taught, it does not line up with Scripture. So if, it, if, it's, if it's against Scripture, but yet... Do you know how many Catholics there are in the world? It's like over a billion, I believe. It's the largest religion in the world. And it's heretical. What's that? And it's heretical. And it's heretical. It's against it. So, I mean, they have their own country. So, the influence of the Roman culture and the Roman Empire that merged even with the religion there is still very much around us altogether. So when I look at this, back in the text uh, in particular, when I look at this, this last kingdom, and notice a lot more time is devoted to talking about it than the other ones. The other ones, it goes really quickly. This next one will come and go away. This next one will come and go away. Why this one? Well, I think it's because it's one that's going to be around for a long time. I don't remember if I said it in the, in the sermon, but if you noticed on the dates of these different empires, what do I have in the notes? Um, page, the first page, notice that their reigns get longer and longer as you go down. Okay? 86 years, 208 years, 268 years, and then with the Roman Empire, it depends on what date you use, you could be as low as 476 or as high as it's still influenced today. And so based upon what I see there, I think, and again, I may be wrong, but I think it's that it's continued on at least and will continue until Christ comes. You may have, Josh and I were talking about this a little bit afterwards, there may be other groups, and there have been other groups that have tried to like rise up and be a world empire again, doesn't work. They're just they're not. It's not. They have not been successful in dominating anything like what we've seen since the Roman Empire. And now, notice all the divisions there. And there's toes, and there's these things mixed together. Well, the marriage part there that you could say with the toes when you have the iron. What was it? I think it was uh, verse. Let's see. Down by forty. Yeah, fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks in pieces and shatters all things. And like uh, iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw in the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. Well, again, the influence of that is now all over with all these different kingdoms, including ours, perhaps, is influenced from that. And so we might be even considered part of the, we're probably the pinky toe. I don't know what we are, but it you know, could be part of that. But, um, and then... They're not going to be held together cause just because iron does not mix well with clay. And so it will continue to fall apart, these different ones, but the influence will continue on, at least the way I'd understand it. Um, but then even this, there's this idea of um, that there'll be these mixed with one another in marriage. And that's, again, I think part of this spreading out. But I'd also possibly apply that to the idea of the state and the religion being come together, married together. And that does not work well, as we know. So quick summary, I guess, of where that would be. So the, the people who are going to take a later date on this, who are going to say that this was written much later, what they're going to say is they're going to say, well, here's the four kingdoms. They're going to say um, the Babylonians, the Medes, then the Persians, and then the Greeks, and the Romans have nothing to do with it. Um, the problem is no, the, the Medes never ruled the world like that. It doesn't, it doesn't add up really well to history as well. And it doesn't seem to make as much sense. So um, with the other, the clear that the Greece is the third one. I mean, it seems like it is with chapter eight. So um, yeah. So if, if that's the case, then they're continuing on. And so then the world will continue to some degree as is, like I said, the idea of downstream as one theologian put it, getting worse and worse as far as the cultures around us, the polluted cultures getting worse and worse and worse until Christ returns until he steps back in. And so part of why I took you to the passage in Luke this morning when we looked at the, um, the wicked servants in the, in, the, in the vineyard there was to show you. Now, he directly is quoting the end of Daniel. So anytime in the New Testament you see that Jesus or Paul or somebody is using something from the Old Testament, you gotta go get, got to go back and figure out, why are they doing that? What's going on? And it seems that Jesus was saying that, again, he's that stone. Now, again, the parable is mostly about the Jewish people rejecting him. That's what it's about. They sent prophets and beat him up, sent his son, and he killed him. But then it ends with anyone that comes up against that rock will be absolutely shattered. But it's through his death that that takes place. 
So that's why I was linking that through too, to tell you that I think the first breaking of the power of those kingdoms is Jesus' first coming, his death and resurrection. But again, they're still around as we look around us today. And right now, the, the, we're here living amongst them and we're to be a light and we're to influence and do whatever we can. But then all traces of them will be taken away when the, uh, when the kingdom comes, when the king comes back. At least that's how I would understand at this point. So, other questions about it? Thoughts? Yeah, the, the one thought I had, mm-hmm. I don't know if everybody, I didn't appreciate this until I taught this in Sunday school. The size of this empire is immense compared to anything today. It's, yeah. it's just gigantic. The, yeah. the, the, Babylonian, the Babylonian Empire. And then the, and then the Grecian Empire. I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah. Plus a little bit more. Yeah, what's w- really fun, which we're going to get to when we get into the Greeks and talk, you know, later in Daniel, but just as a side note, notice in here it does say with that uh, third kingdom, um, let's see, uh, and yet a third kingdom, I'm in verse 39, of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Just that little comment is linked to, from what we can see, Alexander, Alexander the Great, where he, by I think it was 31, he had, he had conquered the, the known world. And even it's noted that he even wept at the end of his life saying, because there was no more worlds for him to conquer, no more lands for him to conquer. lost one battle. Yeah, it's unbelievable. That's how you get the nickname the Great. <laughs> kind of how that happens. So, <clears throat> But again, so what difference does this make though, right? Like, how is it helpful for us to know that there's a kingdom that's coming that will destroy all of these kingdoms. That's part of what we were walking through today. Because I think the temptation is that we will look at those old kingdoms and separate ourselves from them. Well, that was those kingdoms. And if there's any significance to that the Roman Empire or the Roman influence and all of those, again, all those together, but specifically that is still carrying on today, well, then that puts us right in the middle of it. And so we would want to not be following after those kingdoms, but we would be following after uh, Christ's kingdom that's coming. So, other thoughts, Justin? Yeah, help us out. Ultimately, it's like that those all those kingdoms are enemies of God, and they'll be used by God to fulfill His uh, full plan of history. Right. So, where that gets uncomfortable for us is if this is an extension, meaning the United States. Or if you're from another country in here, I don't know if we have any other guests, but meaning the United States as an extension of the Roman Empire, that's not, that means we're not for God. We're not on Jesus' team as, as a nation. Now, again, going back to was our nation founded off of principles that match? Yes, absolutely. And I believe that's why God has blessed. But that doesn't mean we're pro God as a nation, pro Jesus in particular as a nation. All these nations begin. Actually, let's do this. This is important. Let's go to Psalm. Go to turn to Psalms. Uh, we're going to go to Psalm two. Psalm two. Psalm two should be right around the middle of the Old Testament, or on your phones. Look at some of you. This phase of it. <laughs> Let's read Psalm, some of Psalm 2 together. Somebody read the first three verses. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their swords from us. Good, stop right there. Let's just, let's just walk through what's going on there. The question is, why do the nations rage? and the people's plot in vain. Now, this nations would be back in the same idea. All the nations. Why don't, now, there are people within those nations, a multitude from every tribe, tongue, and nation, who are ultimately, they belong to the king, right? And as we read in the Jeremiah passage at the end of the scriptures, whatever nation we're in, we're supposed to live in it, and we're supposed to be a blessing to it, and we're supposed to work hard and be faithful people, but making sure that we're not of that nation. See, kind of that idea of in the world, but not of it, right? We need to be in Cedar Key, but we really can't be of Cedar Key, meaning, or in the United States, but not of the United States. Just work your way out. You know, you just work about Cedar Key, Florida, United States, 
world, in the world, not of it. So the same is true in the United States, but not of it, in and but not of, okay? So we're a part of it. So all the nations are raging. The peoples are plotting in vain. The kings of the earth, look at this, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. All the rulers and the kings is a picture. They're all coming together and they're going to go against the Lord and his anointed. Now who's the anointed one of the Lord with a capital A, you think? It's Christ. It's, it's, it's his son, right? That is, okay, so they're all going to plot together. And here, what do they want to do? Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. What's the heart of what they want? What's that saying? To, 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 to have their cast away their cords from us. They want autonomy. They want autonomy. autonomy. Good. Autonomy. They want to be independent. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I just, when Satan tempted Jesus and he told him he'd give him all the kingdoms, they're raging against God right. because it's Satan. Yeah. Well, and good, Miss Beth. That's important. Yeah, Miss Beth, that's super important because how can he offer the kingdoms unless he's been given them by God? Just like Nebuchadnezzar, how does he have a kingdom? Because God allows him to have a kingdom. So if Satan can actually offer that, then that means he's, in that, in that sense, he's over all the kingdoms. Which we have to get includes this one, includes all of them. And so that's what he's willing to say, hey, come alongside and you can have everything in this kingdom. And scripture's saying they're just raging against him and they want autonomy from God. That's why we've moved. Start off pretty decent as a country and have moved away. What do we want? We want to be disconnected from God, ultimately. We have this idea of separation of, of church and state, but it shouldn't be a separation from God and truth. And even how we, there should still be, we have to understand that our, all countries are still under so, the sovereignty of God and, and rightly have to follow him. They, don't, they choose not to, but they should because he's the one who's over. And we just want to get away from that. Because if we can get away from God, take this step with me. If God's here, then that means there's absolute truth. And there's things that are right, and there's things that are wrong. And generally speaking, those things that are, are right, we don't like those as much. <laughs> the things that are wrong, we tend to like those a little bit more. And if God is there, then we have to follow those things. But if you can get rid of God, if you can get rid of, and the way you do that is you attack the word, right? You attack the word of God. And then you can say, well, God is really whatever I think he is. Well, now you're, now you're getting away from absolute truth. So part of what we do is we attack truth, and if we attack truth, then guess what? Truth is just relative. It's whatever I want to do. It's whatever you want to do. And so all the nations want to move away. They want to, this, this language here. They want to cast away their cords. Let's get the cords of God and his anointed away from us. It's autonomy. That's the word. Okay. That's what he says. Somebody else pick up in four. He who sits in the heavens and laughs. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. <clears throat> Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Yeah, good stuff there. So, wow. So, <laughs> do you see the picture? The kings of the earth and all the rulers, they're all getting this big meeting. And they're going to set themselves against God. And they're saying, hey, what can we do? We're going to plot against God and his anointed. We're going to become autonomous. In verse 4, what is God doing? He's laughing. He's laughing at them. He who sits in the heavens is laughing and holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, the one that actually matters, the one who does whatever he pleases, brings up kings, puts down kings, puts up rulers, puts down rulers. The one who does that, as for me, I'm setting my king, the king, on Zion, my holy hill. I tell, verse 7, I tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Who is, what's going on with this conversation? It's Jesus. Yeah, the Lord speaking here to Christ, his anointed one, and saying, you're my son, and I've begotten you, right? What is Jesus? He's the only begotten. And I will make the nations your heritage. Now let's take that idea for a moment. How are the nations Jesus' heritage? Go back to the Old Testament and think when we started to hear promises and things about nations. What's that? Abraham, Abraham right? Those of you who's in the Genesis class, show hand. Who's in the Genesis class? Mr. Doug? <laughs> Jenny? Yeah, okay, you're in the Genesis class. You guys have been going through Genesis, and 
God makes a covenant and says, from you, Abraham, all the nations are going to be blessed through your seed. Through your seed in particular, right? Abraham's like, I don't have kids. <laughs> God takes care of that. Isaac, Jacob come along, but it's still through the seed that's coming. Paul explains that to be Christ in Galatians. And even points out, it doesn't say seeds, it's a singular seed. One person will, be the, will bless all the nations. So this idea here of, you are my son, today I have begotten you, ask, ask it of me and I will make the nations your heritage. The ends of the earth are your possession. This is showing that Christ has given the kingdom over all. So now it goes back to the kingdom of Daniel. He comes, as soon as he's born, the kingdom is beginning right then. As soon as he comes to the earth. And wherever the king is, guess what? That's where the kingdom's at. That's why he can go around and he'll say, the kingdom of God, Mark chapter 1, kingdom of God is at hand. He reads Isaiah and he goes, the kingdom of God's among you. But then, when he's talking to Pilate, he says, my kingdom ultimately isn't this world. Not yet. That's what he's saying. He's going to go, but yet he gives us his spirit, so he's still here. So you want glimpses of the kingdom, you see it here. You see it when God's people are together. That's glimpses of the, the kingdom ultimately. Now, does Jesus have authority over everything? Absolutely he does. But in, it, what God has decided to do is that this thing grows spiritually among all the nations as the nations themselves overall get worse and worse and worse. The kingdom of God is still growing and growing and growing. But then they turn so much against us, against God's people, that eventually he comes in and brings the hammer. And that's when Christ returns, and that's when the pieces, I would argue, the pieces that he already crushed at the cross are blown away. And so that's when the king is set up on Zion, if you will. Um, so the ends of theirs, you, look at this. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Another way of saying the same thing that we saw, right? In this, I mean, before it's a rock, now he's going to do it. So what does that mean? They have no chance against him. So we've got to be very careful as followers of Christ that we're not playing for the wrong team sometimes. Right? I mean, I don't want to be identified as those that are against Christ. And so we want to be very careful with what we're doing with that. Thoughts here? Questions? Just nothing? <laughs> Keep going? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 10, 11, 12. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. You want to do anything? I don't, how do you feel about the person in the White House? You could send them this passage. That's the most loving thing you could do. Be like, be warned, just so you know. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. What do you mean, kiss the sun? What does that mean? What are you picturing there when, when you're telling them? Because you kiss the ring. Kissing the ring, right? That's kind of that's a picture that I have. Yeah. Kiss the sun. Pay homage to the sun. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Very clear passage kind of echoing the same thing that we see in Daniel, that all the nations, all of them are against the Lord and his anointed one. So choose wisely your team. <laughs> Make sure you're on Jesus' team and not the team of others. Thoughts? Come on. You have something. I, so I was, you made me think of something. That a, lo a lot of times we tend to separate people into liberals and conservatives. It's right. a very common sure. yeah. Yeah, yeah. sort of thing. And, um, and so I've got to watch myself or I, or I develop attitudes about right. people that put them in boxes, which is not good. Right. Not good. Because we're all saved by grace, right? Right. But um, I think part of why that happens is it's probably true that a large number of conservatives are got to even be careful to say this, are more Christian than the other side, okay? Okay. Um, and because of that, we, I think we, we might conflate that, conflate that to, to say, well, these are all Christians and those are all bad guys. Right. We're the good guys and they're the bad guys. Right. And then the danger is you actually merge with that segment that you think right. are all Christians. They're not 
Christians. You know, Christians right. don't live for money. They right. don't live for power. They shouldn't, right. They, yeah. they right. shouldn't. Right. No, right. They're living for the wrong kingdom. Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the I think the political realm that we saw this past time was was very very challenging for the church. I think it a lot of division and um, it's sad because again our our kingdom is a different kingdom. Now there's no question that when you get into I think the stances that are taken by the different uh, parties and things, I think some match up one matches up more with scripture than the other. I would say, um, but that doesn't mean it's still God's team. <laughs> Got to be very careful. It doesn't mean it's God's team just because more things agree. And so I think that, I feel like, man, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like this Satan who's over these kingdoms, he's crafty. He is wise. He's been watching us since the beginning. He's the one that tempted Eve. He knew how to do it. And it's not like he's slowing down anytime soon. It's the same stuff. And he knows where to come where to hit us, and, and just watch us. I mean, can you imagine, if you can observe people, just observing people, and you watch somebody, and you study them, right, like people who stalk people or whatever like that, and you observe somebody, man, you can learn a lot. And you're not with them all the time. They don't have to rest, that we know. I mean, they're just around trying to destroy Satan, demons. They're just watching all the time. What can I do to destroy this church, this person, this marriage, whatever it is, and just watch and watch and watch? And guess what? We are all the same as Adam and the same as Eve, and we're all we have this that sinful nature, and we will just go those same ways. And he is crafty. And when you talk about this COVID stuff, and you talk about the election, and how he just, the church has just struggled as far as unity. And good churches, quote unquote, that love Jesus, love the word, divided and angry with one another over a different perspective on a mask or a vaccine or whatever it is. And it's, it's unbelievable how quickly it happened. I mean, right, right before the you know, election and all that, I mean, it was just all of a sudden it was there. And you've got, you've got pastors quitting the ministry because like, I don't even know what to do. This is crazy. And just churches falling apart. And I, I, I think it was one in five or two in five were closing and just remarkable over things truthfully that are of this kingdom ultimately i mean that's really what those things are about is this kingdom and this life and that's what was dividing um so quickly and so other thoughts it's part of why this is so important for us going through daniel right now is how do we think through the how do we think through these things you know, Joni? i view some of our leadership as holding their hand out and asking us to kiss their rings. Okay, them. yeah. Because they're going to save ourselves from us. Right. And we should thank them for that. Right. And right. But yeah. some of us can think for ourselves. Right. Um, yeah. But I think I see that arrogance. Sure, sure. In a lot of yeah. Like and so and, and so really you gotta think about this too with that Mr. Jerry. Like in the political realm, there's no I don't there's not gonna be really anybody who's in politics who's gonna be like, man, I just really would love to give away power. <laughs> <laughs> They, they may like be like, we want less power than this, this group over here wants, but in politics itself, like, it's still about power. Like, it's not like, oh, I just would love to give it all back to you. Like, that's not how it works, and these at least. So um, we have to be mindful of those things, and that goes back to those areas of making sure that we're doing our part and letting them know what God says that they're supposed to be doing and not doing and making them aware. I mean, I think it would be really great for us to send our leaders these warnings and just say, hey, you know, not like a, I don't mean in a nasty way, but like in a good way, like, hey, just so you know, Christ is the one on the throne, you should follow the Bible. <laughs> it's going to go well for you if you do when you are considering these things and send it to them and um, try to influence because, again, that, that, that is the idea. It's, it's, more, it's more power. I mean, that's how it works. They're not going to give it back. Well, <laughs> how, many, how many of us want to? Like, and we're not even in politics, but how many of us, when you have control, when you have power, relationships, or whatever it is, generally we're not like, oh, you know what, I'd like to give that away. Although some of you have jobs in the church, and you're like, I'd love to give that away, but that doesn't count. That's different. That's different. Thoughts? What else? You talk about the vision, you know, when COVID came, but although we, we uh, separated a little bit, we, we banded together in groups, 
and pray for each other. Mm -hmm. It shows how the Lord kept us strong here. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think God was very, very kind and gracious to our church. I think he, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk to a lot, you know, not a lot, I'll talk to other pastors, and um, and it didn't go as well in, in, in many churches. And I'm just, that's just God's, you know, grace upon us, and he, you know, teaching us that we need to do the, the things that he said and praying for one another. And that's such a great thing to do is when you really have an issue with somebody, start praying for them, you know, and hopefully the Lord will change your heart towards them on that matter. Um, but, yeah, that's true, Eddie. And again, you know, in Romans, as we were going through, there's just areas of, of preference. We have to be careful of things that are clear in Scripture that we need to obey and we need to hold each other accountable and help each other follow those things in Scripture. And then there's things that are areas of preference. And we need to be open to others disagreeing with us on things and being like, okay, well, that's where you're at and that's where I'm at. So we can disagree and still pray for each other and love Jesus and continue on. And so, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I've been convicted by a lack of listening on my part and by many of my friends and family in the church because it's like a lot of yelling at and a lot of being yelled at, but not a lot of listening. And I think that's a way to exemplify that humility of Christ. When we, yeah. we don't have to agree, but we can listen well. And that's something I've been convicted of, especially in the middle of all this mess. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we're supposed to be slow, slow to speak quick to listen, quick to hear what people are saying. And generally, if you cannot repeat back to somebody what they just said or what their argument is, then you're not listening very well. You should be able to faithfully say what they're... Now, you don't have to agree with it. In fact, you can say it's wrong because of this reason or whatever, but at least faithfully show them you know, or, or repeat back what their view is. And I think that's something we as Christians should be doing in, in this scenario. And then, and then you can tell them where it's wrong. But at least repeat it back first, you know, before saying, well, you know, that so many times we build a straw man. That's where that, that idea comes from. I don't know if you're familiar with the straw man argument. You hear that stuff. But ultimately, it's where you're kind of building something that's not really what they believe. And it's nice and simple to take down. So you can just knock it over pretty easily. But you're not actually representing them well. We always would want to do that. But you have to listen well to be able to do that. That's true. I see your hand, Josh. Mm -hmm. uh, um... And I apologize, I kind of came in a little later, but um, one of the things that I think uh, many people in the church lack is what, what you said we need to, we, we it, like more than just a suggestion, I think we, we failed in this department of not being vocal and saying, look, this is what the Word of God mm -hmm. says to our to our leaders. Not saying, hey, we're the state church, like we, we're, but to tell them, hey, you have an obligation by the Word of God mm -hmm. to to uphold life, to mm -hmm. to uphold uh, human dignity, to mm -hmm. to punish evil, to, to mm -hmm. promote what is good. Mm -hmm. And when they when they falter in that, or they want to step into to realms that they don't supposed to, right. it. Biblically speaking, it's the church's job to come up and say, whoa, 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 yeah. get mm -hmm. back in your lane, mm -hmm. or else you're going to have to answer to God. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think we, we need to be more vocal, and I mm -hmm. think um, I've been convicted lately of, of not being um, as involved with local politics. Mm. And, and caring about what is going on in my community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that um, we should care about. We mm -hmm. should care about. Is yeah, I think it's what, you know, have a family. Plan a, mm -hmm. plan, a, plan a garden. You know, be faithful and be a blessing to the community you're in praying for them. And at the same time, don't let your heart get too into that mm -hmm. to where you lose sight of the kingdom, right? Keeping the kingdom in sight mm -hmm. the whole time. The yeah. yeah. Kurt, did you have something? Oh, he gave me the scratch. I thought it, I thought it was coming. It was, it was right there. Anything else on this? Thing? A year ago, January, mm -hmm. some churches got a little slap on the hand mm -hmm. or knocking the knees, and they folded. Mm -hmm. A lot of them did, mm -hmm. and it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of you know the politics. Yeah. And the so going with what we're saying, just so you know, the louder you speak, the more you will get. Pushback. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the more you stand on the word of God, the more pushback you're going to get. And that's going to be true if all the nations are, under, you know, against God. Like, that's just going to be what it is. And so that doesn't mean we don't do it. It just means that you follow scripture and we do those things. And you prepare for that and know Jesus had promised that. It's, it's, what's, it's what's normal. It's easy right now when they're not here doing that, of course. But 
don't be fearful either. The Spirit will give us the strength to handle that in the moment that it's time. Again, I've said this to you guys many times. There's, not a, there's no grace for what you dream up in your brain that hasn't happened yet. You won't be able to get through that. When you think of, but what if this happens, and then this, and I don't know how I would ever make it through it. Well, because that hasn't happened yet, and so you don't have the grace of God to get through that yet. When the time comes, whatever it is, I promise you, he will give you the grace to get through whatever he has called you to. He will help you when it happens, not what you dream up. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The Jordan River never stopped until Joshua put his foot in it. Right, there you go. It's a great example from the book of Joshua. Yeah, it's not going to, well, I don't know how we're going to cross that thing. Well, you've got to move forward and then the Lord will take care of it. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Yes, ooh. It's, yeah, it's true. And did you know? Oh, yeah, Justin, did you? I think there's also a good example of, like, as Christians, we, in this day and age, we, you know, tend to have, like, uh, this contempt for uh, this authority that we think is, a, um, is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But he actually is a great example of um, actually, you know, staying faithful in God and glorifying God and having respect for the enemy in enemy territory. Right. And bringing glory to God in, in that action, but through faith in God. Yeah, until right until they forbid something that He has to do, exactly, or takes away some you know takes away something that God would forbid, you know, commands Him to do something that God would forbid. So until that time, he, you know. But even you know, he's still respectful, but it's like, sorry, I can't go there. And, you know, at this point, I have to draw the line with the you know eating of the food. But even how he does it is very wise, and so you can. I think you can respond to people and to authority. Sometimes we can respond in ways that if you would respond with more wisdom and prudence, you're actually getting the pushback you're getting isn't because of the topic, it's the, actually the way you responded. If you, so you have to be very wise on how you do it, still holding obviously firmly to the word of God, but you can say it one way, kind of just the simple truth of a soft answer will turn away wrath. We use that in our home all the time <laughs> with our kids and things. And so we don't have to be, uh, you know, yelling and screaming about these things or insulting, um, but we can still stand on truth and do it the right way. And again, some of it's on conscience, but conscience, but ultimately saying, I can obey up until this point, and then I'm not going to obey any further because the word of God doesn't allow me to, and so I'm not going to do it. And standing on that, yeah. Last thing that I wanted to point out was um, from the sermon that I wanted to just discuss with you was the difference in Daniel and the captain of the guard and how Daniel would not take credit, right? But he gave glory to God. But the captain of the guard quickly was saying, uh, I found this guy among the exiles that, would, uh, that can tell you your, your dream. Um, I, I mentioned it briefly in the sermon, but I think it's really important. We really should be a people that take ownership of when we mess up. That's so hard. It can be really hard to admit that we've messed up and, and call it that too. Like sometimes you might say, oh, I messed up, but to actually call something, I sinned against you or I've sinned in this way or I was wrong in this way. Um, and, and then not trying to lift ourselves up, but trying to lift up other people. Like if you're making it your habit of constantly trying to lift up others and point to God, man, you are not going to be discouraged very, very often because you're going to be so focused on others that you're not going to be focused on yourself and what's going on. Um, uh, I think it's C.S. Lewis, I think, who talks about 
when he's talking about pride, and, and I've quoted it to you before, but it's not thinking less of yourself like, oh, I'm such a worm, but thinking of yourself less often, or thinking about yourself less often. So thinking about others, and how can I lift them up? And that seems to be what Daniel's doing, whereas Arioch is just right away. He's like, whatever he can do to get uh, the king's approval. And so um, just continuing for us to all grow in that, in that way and be different than the world. It is different when you see somebody actually take ownership, like, in a, like a, a, a public figure or something like that, when they actually just stand there and say, I was wrong, please forgive me, versus excuses or blame casting or anything else. And as Christians, that's really what we should be doing. Thoughts there? When has that happened? When has that ever happened? <laughs> I'm sure it's happened somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere, once. Yeah. I think that really does bleed into the uh, Daniel chapter 3. Is, and not to take Don't it. take the spoiler. No, good. <laughs> but, I mean, I mean, how does he respond to hearing that he's, yeah. he's, a gold, he's the gold head of this right. marvelous right. empire? Yes. I do want you to read forward in the text. You don't have to wait each Sunday, right? We want you reading forward. And so it looks like there's a breakthrough, maybe, at the end of chapter 2. Like, oh, he's the king of lords, the lord of kings, and he's great. And then chapter 3, he's like, you know what I need? You know what we need? A big statue of me. But it's a, it's a response. It's right. A response it's a response. Dream, yeah. Because... But then it'll be interesting when we get into chapter 4 and how God continues to work. So anyway, we're going to get there. All right, Miss Faye's got something for us, then we're going to close. I just had a curious okay. thought about... Daniel has not taken any credit or right. for it. But then, when Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before him, yeah. he didn't object. Or yeah, he was like, yeah, man, stop that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, it was here. Miss Faye, just so you know, she loves to find these awkward things in the text. In front of everybody. In front of everybody. Well, no, the other the other day she did it. Do you remember what you asked the other day? So I don't know how many of you noticed this. I don't know when you stop it. I don't know how many noticed this. Uh, or will notice this, right? We haven't gotten there yet, I guess. But with um, uh, Daniel's three friends, whenever they're going to go and they go into the fiery furnace, yeah. all three are put in there. Of course, there's a fourth person. Yeah. But the fourth person isn't Daniel. So Ms. Faye goes, where's Daniel during that time? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell me. So obviously we don't need to know that. But then we, we have a little conspiracy. We're like, well, maybe he was back in the so kingdom. So my curiosity is just curiosity. Yeah, Daniel's hanging out in the kingdom and this is happening outside. I don't know. I, I don't know. He got to go to the lion's den by himself. What's that? Yeah he, yeah, he got to go in the lion's den. He had his own fun. He got to do his own thing. No, but it is interesting. He falls down, and there are others, you know. But we see that as a response, not only of unbelievers, but even believers will do that. If you look, read the book, book of Revelation, the way John responds. I mean, people will, when they see something great that God has done, we are made to worship. And sometimes, and that's really part of our biggest issue, is we worship the wrong thing sometimes. And even that can happen, even in believers' lives. I think we do it often, where we're worshiping our things. And so I think... They already had pagan worship and obviously worship the statue. So I think he was just kind of responding and worshiping him as a demigod, maybe, or something like that. So, um, yeah, interesting. All right.